Hello, everyone. And we welcome you to the Plainfield Sunday morning roundtable discussion. Thank you all for joining us. Um, Benjamin and Craig are manning everything in New Jersey. The rest of us, for some of us anyway, are at Cape Cod, and we're glad that you could join us here today. And we will begin with our morning prayer. I'm reading from page 186 of Divinity Course in General Collectania, the Blue Book, and 412 of Science and Health. Our work is not to change God's work, for that is finished and perfect. Neither is it to make error nothing, for it is that already, but to stand apparently in the midst of it, unmoved, knowing its nothingness. Isaiah 43, 2. No mortal thought put in action by any mesmerist or combined force of mesmerists, or anyone whom they would employ has any power to affect. There is no malicious animal magnetism. The Lord, he is God, and there is none beside him. Proverbs 16, 7. Meet every false claim with the absolute truth. Nothing short of that will answer. John 8, 32. The power of Christian science and divine love is omnipotent. It is indeed adequate to unclasp the hold and to destroy disease, sin, and death. Very big. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can everyone hear us all right? Yes. Good. Okay. All right. We will go on to our watching point, Karen. Watch number 302. Watch you discern what absolute or divine science is and see that Christian science is its application to the human need. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Eddy had science revealed to her then she demonstrated it in every possible way. Divine science would be of little value to mortals without the bridge that makes it practical and operative in our present experience as Christian science. Electricity filling the atmosphere was of no value to mortals until it was harnessed and made available for use. Mrs. Eddy gave her revelation to the world in her authorized writings. Then, in her life, she gave her own practice or demonstration of it. Her life is linked with her revelation in that the latter can never be understood in its fullness without a study and understanding of the former. Once Mrs. Eddy wrote to a student, quote, I thank God for your faith in him and your true sense of me. Why? Because in over one quarter of a century, I have never in one single instance seen these fail to carry a student safely on in growth and prosperity. But in every single instance, the loss of those mental conditions has wrecked the student. Once I was young and now am young, but I have never seen the righteous forsaken, those who are right, misled. One might tell a patient with heart trouble that his only true heart was divine love pulsating in heaven. But to be practical and to meet the human need, one would also have to assure the patient that his response to this pulsating of love was perfect, indestructible, and perpetual. Then he would awaken to realize that he had no heart trouble. Thank you. Any comments on that? Well, I'm so grateful that this church is uh, constantly reminds us of the importance of holding the Sazetti correctly 
And um, as she said, it it's what uh, it wrecks the student if they don't if they don't understand her. The, she said the revelator and the revelation have to both be understood. And um, if not, it's uh, that's what's been happening in the movement. So I, here she says it again. It's very very important, and I'm grateful that. Plainfield makes that very clear. Thank you. Could I say something? Yes, please, Mary. I'm really grateful that Plainfield exists and that we have the chance to work on this. Um, I'll say recovery of our uh, beliefs because um, every time something comes up to me, I realize that the gems from Plainfield help, the reading that Florence gave today from the Divinity Course on page 186. I'll go back to that also from the Science and Health. So all of this is helping us to go forward, even if it seems humanly quite the opposite. So I'm grateful that this uh, opportunity is made possible for me to join in. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and we are too. <laughs> yeah, we are too. Thank you. Well, it brings up in this about Mrs. Eddy's example, and it's very, very important that we have this example, this model. And that's one of the reasons I'm so grateful to Carpenter, Mr. Carpenter, for providing us with this in his books, and especially Mary Baker Eddy, her spiritual footsteps. So, you know, we have ideals, models that we follow, um, and it's it's important. We don't always live up to those ideals, but it's important we hold those ideals in thought. That's true about our nation, to have the ideal of freedom for all in thought, which is what it was established on. If we lose our ideals or we bash them to pieces because the people didn't live up to it, well, that's foolishness and you know this is what some so-called christian scientists have done too christian science is in a way an ideal we hold that ideal in thought in mind to bring it about and we don't bash it because other people or ourselves <laughs> have not lived up to its standards we keep holding it in thought and we will bring it to pass mrs eddie says that doesn't she <laughs> So we must well, she also oh sorry. Go ahead, whoever's speaking. Go on. Lenny. Oh, it's Lenny. Uh she also said that was one of the first things she says in I can't remember if it's I think it's in the preface that she didn't uh she didn't I I'm paraphrasing, but she didn't adjust her words to suit, you know, uh basically to suit the sign of the times. Like she didn't you know, these days I feel like so much in Christian science is like just go getting along to go along and it, but Mrs. Eddy didn't do that, and she says that very clearly in in the preface that she, you know, she didn't adjust what she was saying to suit thought or the signs of the times or anything like that. Thank Correct. You. She yes. didn't compromise one inch, and we shouldn't either if we're, you know, if we're serious about this. And I was just I was just listening to footsteps. I think it was chapter forty one, forty two. I can't remember which one. It was just yesterday, where she said that that um, if if you understand who she really is, then you understand that the book was pure inspiration. When she says, "I was not the um, this God is the author." Um, um, anyway, she refers many times to the fact that she personally didn't write the book it came through god and when you understand her true role in this you want you get that you understand that very clearly and why she said i have to go back to the book i have to study it um because it was all it all came from inspiration and she had to also uh keep studying it just like her students thank you Yes, it was divine. It has a divine authorization, as does the manual, which is why she refused to change that. It's why, uh, and, you know, I feel 
in our Declaration of Independence, our Constitution. It has divine a divine origin. Whether it was lived up to or not is something else, but but we don't destroy it or get angry at it <laughs> for not living up to it. It's it's we the people that have to live up to it. Um, so and there've been glimpses throughout all time of the divine operating and all any good that has been accomplished anywhere in any nation has been based on that, on the divine. And that's what we look for. It's our spiritual history that must be acknowledged and preserved. And that is what we appreciate. And that is what we hold in thought and, and be grateful for. Mm -hmm. And to get to the, uh, you know, to the to, to the fact that Mrs. Mrs. Eddy, um, you know, she said she was a scribe under orders, but she had to be the highest spiritual thought in the world at the time in order to get those orders and actually be the scribe. <laughs> and she said, you know, on the first thing in our uh, lesson this morning says to understand God is the work of eternity and demands absolute consecration of thought, energy, and desire. That is the high ideal that Christian science is, and Mrs. Eddy proved it and told us that, you know, that there's work to be done here. I want to think daily. Go ahead, please. No, I think daily, you know, having more faith, more faith, more faith as we grow in God, and then, of course, seeing her in her right sense, the sense that she is a woman in the apocalypse and what the book is for. Is it, go take the book and read it and understand, and it will you know, shape your way. I think what she's saying here to the student, I thank God for your faith in him and your true sense of me. This, to me, is very important. Mm -hmm. It's all important. Yeah, thank you. It's essential. And this is what this lesson is about and what we'll be speaking more about. And there was one other thing. It, it does mention heart at the end. And I believe it was Jacob who sent this um, from Martha Wilcox, but I'm not sure where in Martha Wilcox. But I thought it was a great statement where he said, heart trouble does not require matter to express itself. It requires belief only. This is true of any ailment. It's belief only. And Mrs. Eddy also talks about um, never treat a man for his belief, but as a belief without a believer. And that's in Collectania, the addenda, page 46. So in all these things, if it's not of God, if it's not understanding divinely from him, it is belief, belief only. And that's what we treat, the belief, the belief that there is an other, a power other than God. So thank you. That was, all, as always, a, a wonderful watching point. They're all so wonderful. Now, our topic is Christian science. And uh, Sharon, will you read the golden text? Second Timothy. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Thank you. Um, Carrie sent me some wonderful articles about gold, the Golden Text and response reading. But this, today I want to start with what Nancy sent to me. Go ahead, Nancy. Um, well, uh, the ending of that. Um, excuse me, verse, rightly dividing the word of truth really stood out to me and the importance for myself to be praying for spiritual understanding as I read and study our textbooks and our lessons. And I found in miscellaneous writings on page 169 an extract from a sermon that Mrs. Eddy, I felt, um, talked about this. Uh, Quote, within, page, within Bible pages, she had found all the divine science she preaches, noticing all along the way of her researches therein 
that whenever her thoughts had wandered into the bypass of ancient philosophies or pagan literature, her spiritual insight had been darkened thereby till she was God-driven back to the inspired pages. Early training through the misinterpretation of the word had been the underlying cause of the long years of invalidism, invalidism she endured before the truth dawned upon her understanding through the right interpretation, which I felt was rightly dividing. With the understanding of scriptural meaning had come physical rejuvenation. The uplifting of spirit was the upbuilding of the body. She affirmed that the scriptures cannot properly be interpreted in a literal way. The truths they teach must be spiritually discerned before their message can be borne fully to our minds and hearts. That there is a dual meaning to every biblical passage, the most eminent divines of the world have concluded. And to get at the highest or the metaphysical, it is necessary rightly to read what the inspired writers left for our spiritual instruction. The literal rendering of the scriptures makes them nothing valuable, but often is the foundation of unbelief and hopelessness. The meta metaphysical rendering, rightly dividing, is health and peace and hope for all. Thank you very much. You're welcome. This, this is what, you know, the conflict between the, the secular world and, and Christianity. It's, it's this misinterpretation of the Bible. And yeah, people don't like it. I don't like it either. And so, and to read what this says, and this was sort of paraphrasing a sermon from Mrs. Eddy, but early training through the misinterpretation of the word had been the underlying cause of long years of invalidism she endured before the truth dawned upon her understanding. This is how damaging the wrong sense of the Bible can be. It holds, it holds people in bondage, and it is the cause of all the conflicts. If we can get this message out, this warring will cease. The right interpretation of the Bible, because no one could resist the truth of it. We argue over definitions, false definitions, what one people, people think is God and what the true definition of God is. I've told, you know, even when my little granddaughter will say, because her, her, her father seems to be, I don't know if he's atheist, but something like that and doesn't believe in God. And I tell her, well, he believes in love, doesn't he? And of course he does. <laughs> so everyone believes in Mrs. Eddy's definition of God and therefore not only believes, but understands it because it's truth. So we just talked about it was divinely inspired. God gave her those words. God gave him the definition of himself. And there should be no conflict over this. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, every time I talk to my my kids about Christian science, I, I usually say at first, like, okay, let's remember God is not some super powerful dude somewhere, you know, <laughs> bestowing gifts and whatever on us. But he's truth and love and life. And, then it starts rightly, you know, that they, they understand more what I'm talking about. So. Thank you. Very essential. And the creed of Christian science is as adherence of truth. What? You take, you take the inspired, inspired word, word of the, of the Bible. Bible. It's our sufficient guide to eternal life. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. The inspired word. She speaks of it often. It must be inspired. And then all this boring would cease. So um, thank you very much for that. And the other that, that I love to, to think about, uh, you know, in the Bible where it says, where sin abounds, let much more grace abound. And in the definition of grace is partly that also the beautiful definition of regeneration and the, the whole of it from the 1828 um, dictionary is the act of producing a new, new birth by the grace of God, 
that change by which the will and enmity of man to God and his law are subdued and a principle of supreme love to God and his law or holy affections are implanted in the heart. That says it, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And this is what we must know. Grace abounds. And all this enmity against God and his word and laws, which is based on misinterpretation and false beliefs, will end. And the grace of God, because we can't go around and do it, right? <laughs> it's pretty impossible. Only God can do this. Only God can implant holy affections in the heart. The renewal of their minds, putting off the old for the new man. This is how we work. This is how we will change everything. But it first begins in our own consciousness. And the more we do that and the more we see it, the more we will see it, the more it will be manifested. And all these wars and fighting and carrying on will cease. There's nothing to fight about. Is there? No. Not really. No. You know the truth. You know the truth. The other is just the misconceptions. And they think it comes from the Bible, so they want to throw out the Bible. And yet the Bible is the word of life. And... Mrs. Eddy says, many times, we've got to study it and know it. So here again, just because people, people have misinterpreted the divine doesn't mean we throw out that divine and just say, oh, it doesn't work. It's terrible. And look, yeah, it's too bad. We don't have sometimes better examples of it, but we're all working on that to be a better <laughs> example. So, And having... The biographies of Mrs. Eddy, <clears throat> seeing how she did it is very helpful for that. You know, seeing how she was always loving, always avoiding Phariseeism. Yes. <laughs> you know, so important. Yes. Um, could I add something about that as well? Yes, thank you. Uh, you know, when I read the life of Mary Baker Eddy, you know, I've been listening to Keystone lately and about her healings at night because I haven't been sleeping well. And I was thinking about how, the, you know, he deals with her love for people, even when they rejected her and they had been working with her as students and she still didn't get into uh, letting them go. She still held on to them as being God's ideas. And this is what I strive to reach that state. Thank you very much. Yeah. We don't let go of our ideal of people either, do we? Just because they're not doing what they should. In science, we know who and what they are. Hold to that ideal. That expression, you don't throw the baby out with the, with the bad water. Bad water. Bad water. Yeah. You hold that ideal. Go ahead. The thought comes to me, Mrs. Eddy really lived God. Her life was uh, expressing, you know, all the, the, the meaning of God, what God is. Life, truth, love. First of, I mean, she lived it. I'm thinking of the synonyms and I'm thinking, you know, I'm looking at her life, how she lived those. She lived God. And this is what we have to do. Yes. Thank you. Yes, she did. Everything she said was truthful. Everything she did was loving. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's essential that we know her life mm -hmm. as, as, as well and as much as we can in order to make this science more practical to us as well. Yeah. Yes, her example. And that's why we put Keystone. Bruce has been recording that. Um, and read it, study it, read a biography every year. Certainly read the Carpenters, what they have written about her, because that is, again, the spiritual interpretation of her, not, not the material, not she was some old crank, um, which some people have thought. Again, mis misunderstanding, misinterpretation. We get the truth, and we hold that ideal in thought <laughs> and, and work as best we can to emulate it. So important too, because I, I 
been thinking about how inspiration, you know, when it's written with inspiration and then we have to read it with inspiration, it's like it's like a form of encryption. And if you don't have that encryption, if you've ever seen, on um, you know, encrypted <laughs> communications, this is just a bunch of numbers and letters, you know, and it's like they're just studying that. And it's, you know, of course, they're not getting anywhere with it. You know, you need that inspiration. It's so important. Yes, thank you. Also, the people that call themselves Christians, um, I thought recent. I've been thinking recently how Jesus, every word that he spoke, everything he did, is an example of what it means to be a Christian. What it looks like, what it sounds like, what it feels like. Everything he did and said is an example to what it means to be a Christian. And yet, there, we know that that is not what Christians would say they're Christians. That is not uh, how they look at him as, as an example for everyone to live if they call themselves Christians. And so it's not surprising that Mrs. Eddy would not be, would be seen, you know, as a Christian scientist, maybe would look at her, but not really think that everything she said and did is how I'm supposed to live. I think so. Yeah, yes. Yeah, just as, as Florence said about Mrs. Eddy, so that is true about the Christ. And what they did, they demonstrated their oneness with the Father. They got rid of their personal sense of themselves and others and let God work through them. And that was divine. And anytime, anywhere, anyone does that, it's divine. But no one did it to the extent of, as the Christ did. Probably the biggest crime that was ever committed was to hide the example of Mrs. Eddy's life. You know, like I said in the watching point, yeah, divine science has always been here, but we needed that bridge or that link. We needed to know that Mrs. Eddy was God appointed and God anointed to show us this way. So, like was mentioned earlier, to learn about her life is really important. Like she said, if you wanted to be a better healer, you should study the life of Jesus, and you will be. Well, if you want to be a better Christian scientist, we need to know what Mrs. Eddy went through and what she did, what her example really was. So there it is. Yeah, and I'll, I'll never forget the beginning of Footsteps. Carpenter says that, yes, you study the Bible, you study science and health, you study prose works, but then you must know how she lived it. You must study her life. Those, those are all important, all important. Because so many people haven't studied her, her life or real biography, and they don't know how to apply it. And Footsteps in particular tells you how to bring it home, as I say. Bring it into your home. Bring it into your experience, as she did. All right, Chardell, your contribution. Okay, I have it. I don't have it. Couldn't print it, so bear with me. It's about, okay, uh, it's from uh, Science and Health. To understand God is what Mr. Gary was talking about, is the work of eternity and demands absolute consecration of thought, energy, and desire. All we correctly know of spirit comes from God, divine principle, and is learned through Christ and Christian science, consecration, solemn devotion. Consecration has been a deep meaning and applying it to being a student of Christian science and my desire to have a better understanding of God is growing in significance for me. I pray to fulfill this demand as stated by Mrs. Eddy. My energy, thought, and desire devoted to knowing God, Christ Christianity, and Christian science. Thank you. Now, as I've said before, if there's anything uh, more important than this, please let me know. <laughs> and in, in the lesson in Science and Health, which sometimes we don't get to, and I want to make sure that we do at least touch on so many wonderful things. Yeah, that, for, that quote that Shardy quoted is the first number one in Science and Health. 
So, you know, those who think it's going to just come to you on a silver platter, no. No, it doesn't. You've got to work for it. And then um, I, one of my favorite chapters in Science and Health, although I love all of them, but that one on spiritualism where it says, all we correctly know of spirit comes from God, divine principle, and is learned through Christ and Christian science. And if this science has been thoroughly learned and properly digested, we can know the truth more accurately than the astronomer can read the stars or calculate the eclipse. How wonderful is that? What greater achievement could there be? This is the pearl of great price. You think you have other more important things to do? Well, you think again. And then, although this volume contains the complete science of mind healing, never before or never believe that you can absorb the whole meaning of the science by a simple perusal of the book. What does that mean? Study it and dig, it, dig into it deeply. Yes, what does the word perusal mean? Is that more of a casual sense? Yeah. Yeah, just, read it quickly and think that you're actually getting it mm -hmm. by just reading it quickly. So the book needs to be studied, and the demonstration of the rules of scientific healing will plant you firmly on the spiritual groundwork of Christian science. This proof lifts you high above the perishing fossils of theories already antiquated and enables you to grasp the spiritual facts of being hitherto unattained and seemingly dim. If you want to. <laughs> you have to want to grasp the spiritual facts if you're going to get them. How many people will have a healing and then forget it and not dig into the books to get a better understanding of what it was that actually healed them? This is where we have to be willing to change our thinking when the healings come when the lessons are learned. This, you know, this requires humility. This requires honesty. To change, it, Mrs. Eddy says, human mind requires a change of base. Right. If we're not willing to change our thinking, to, to change what is important to us, then, you know, a, a Christian science treatment, a Christian science healing is not going to be of value to us. You know, if, if, if your materialism is so thick <laughs> that you, you don't want to get rid of it, replace it with the bliss of loving unselfishly, as Mrs. Eddy says. It requires a change and a willingness to change. And that willing, you know, that change is often difficult because you've got people around you who think of you the way you used to be. And they're going to have to change the way they think about you if you're going to think about yourself correctly. So it's a it's an effort, you know, and that's what uh, so. It's what Mrs. Eddy refers to as, you know, going on the cross. <laughs> You're going to have to take the heat. People aren't going to be happy with your changes. Some people aren't. And that is why when you spend time with people who have known you formally, you always have to be on guard. As kind and loving and maybe as, especially if the experience is very pleasant, they see you in a different light. And if you're not if you don't have your defenses up and if you're not truly aware of it, it will it will get into your thought in one way or another. You must be very careful of this always. This is why never absent from your post, never off guard, never ill humored, and never unready to work for God. And Lenny told me this week. Her little dog is a living example of that. <laughs> I'm happy to hear that. It's nice to have that reminder. So, yes. And the, the Can I say one thing about the science and health? Yeah. Um, um, on Tony's uh, website, there is a testimony there 
that um, I sent to him. It was from Daniel Jensen of uh, lecture where he pointed out this this particular testimony. Not only did this woman get her hearing, who lost her ear, didn't have any apparatus to hear with, so called, in one of her ears, and yet she, her hearing completely came back. But what impressed him and why he mentioned it in his lecture was how she read Science and Health. And she explains how she read. She took one sentence and thought about it and asked herself, do I really believe this because I believe it or somebody is telling me, do I believe it? Do I believe it? Do I think it's true? And because she read um, Science and Health that way, it it brought these wonder, this incredible healing of many different things, but total Total, um, her her hearing was completely restored, even without any eardrum in one of her ears. So anyway, it's a, it's a good testimony on his website. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. No, that was not a simple perusal of the book, was no. it? No. And it was <laughs> because you're a second or third generation scientist. You have to get it for yourself. You have to prove it for yourself. You have to ask those questions. And then it's yours. You've made it yours. This is such an important topic this week. I'm grateful for the lesson writer because so much has been, uh, well, it's why Christian science gets so bad now because people haven't studied it. They're superficially doing things Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know. And calling themselves Christian scientists. Yeah. And then people say, geez, what's that all about? (laughs) So, but again, we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. That does not mean the science doesn't work. It does. (laughs) And again, um, one cannot, Christian science is not an exception to the general rule, but there is no excellence without labor in a direct line. One cannot scatter his fire and at the same time hit the mark to pursue other vocations and advance rapidly in the demonstration of this science is not possible. I don't think that needs explanation. No, it doesn't say it's not recommended. It says it's not possible. (laughs) And then the elucidation of Christian science lies in its spiritual sense. And this sense must be gained by its disciples in order to grasp the meaning of the science. Many people do not understand the science because of their gross materialism. And if you really want to, and you have this block, then you just kind of work to chip away at it and not be so enamored with with all of the things of this world. Now, this goes back then again to something very important, which is Psalm 119. And we have had this, uh, Thomas has given it to us as Bible study, which is probably good to go over it again. But it was interesting because... Dear Carrie sent me this wonderful article taking up each of these verses um, because these would be the stumbling blocks as to why you couldn't advance in science when we're when, when we all can if we want to. And it starts with that teach me, O oh Lord, right? Teach me, Lord. I need I need you to teach me. It, it's that humility. And this one article by S. Conway is entitled Teach Me, O Lord. And it says the verses of this section contain apparently an enumeration of various facts which rendered it essential that the Lord should teach him if he were ever to learn. As it has been said, the man who wrote this psalm knew two things. First, that there was something he must and would learn, for all his well-being depended on it. And this something was the word of God, which he calls now by one name and now by another. But he also knew a second thing, and that was he could never teach himself. God must teach. This is the burden of his prayer, not only in this section, but throughout the psalm. For the difficulties in the way of his acquiring this knowledge were many and great, and he suggests He suggests some of them here. 
kind of goes along with the good seed when we read about this. But these are the stumbling blocks. And this is why I started out with, with the regeneration, because only God can do this work in you. You can try and work and study. And for a long period of time, I tried and worked and studied. But until I got the point that I had to get rid of Mary out of the way and let God work, I was a terrible mess because you can't do it humanly is the point. Must be done divinely. All right. So verse 30, verse 30, actually the first one, 33. First teach me the way of thy statutes and I will keep it unto the end. So what is the big um, stumbling block? Keep it unto the end. What does that mean? Persistence? Yes. It's easy to get complacent. Forget, lest thou forget. Consistent. Consistent. Yeah. yeah, this this is showing the light. Go ahead, Florence. I just said, just make it a way of life. This is how I live. Thank you. Exactly. A way of life. This is how I live. Try the other way. It didn't work. So. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. It didn't. <laughs> More it failed miserably. You make it a way of life, and we you you know we start our mornings with the daily duties, um, not just saying them, but imbibing them, thinking about them throughout the day. Am I getting a personal sense of things? Am I being uh, animated by um, yeah personal sense or? being angry or irritated. They're all in there. Are, am I forgetting my duty to God, to our leader and to mankind? You keep judging erroneously. Forgiveness, yes. What's that? Judging erroneously. Judging erroneously. <laughs> and this is one of the things, too, in the Bible, the, to make sure you, you focus on what Christ Jesus said, because a lot of people say a lot of different things. It's Christ Jesus we focus on, Christ Christianity. Being influenced or influencing erroneously, all those things. Are we doing that throughout the day? Think about these things, apply it. And then knowing God is life. God is my life. God is the only pure life. Mind. God is mind. God is the only pure and perfect mind. Not just say it. Think about it. Then you go on. God is health, vision, whatever it is you need. He is. He should be our all. This is how we start our mornings, and then we get into the lesson, and not a mere perusal, rushing through it in 15 minutes, but studying it, looking up words. As Karen said about that woman, asking, do I really believe this or not? The, I wanted to say that the uh, teach me, O oh Lord, you know, Mrs. Eddie called it the divinity course. So. Thank you. Yes, she did. And that's Carpenter. Thank you. This is so important, and this, this brings out the lack of perseverance. You start off just great, all enthusiastic, whoopee, kadoo, and then suddenly nobody ever hears from you again. <laughs> and we've seen that many times, and that's unfortunate, and I, there's so much I can do about it. That's why we keep doing what we're doing, you know. Um, and then pretty soon, if they come back, you know, they come back with their tail between their legs, usually with some big problem. <laughs> so you don't have to do that. There's no suffering. Please, let's take the science route. So this one brings out a lack of perseverance. It would be a stumbling block. And then the second, give me understanding and I shall keep thy law. Yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. And this takes up what? Half-heartedness. Yeah. You can't do it just, oh, I'll try it today and maybe, you know, if it doesn't interfere with my trip to Disney World, it'll be great. But if it does, then no, I don't think I'll do it for too long. And, you know, maybe today, but not tomorrow. And maybe, you know, after I have my visit or my trip to Europe, maybe then I'll take it up seriously. But, yeah. but don't let it interfere with my golf outing. Yeah, which is, and I'm not saying or my tennis match. <laughs> any of this is necessarily wrong. But if, if you don't, as Florence said, make it a way of life in whatever you do or doing it with God. That's the difference, and it's a big difference. So your whole heart, 
everything you've got, your whole heart. You want it more than anything because, as we just said, it's a pearl of great price. And if you're not feeling it, well, get where you're feeling it, okay? <laughs> That's the big thing now. I'm just not feeling it, Well, Get to where you're feeling it. Okay, and then... Make me to go in the path of thy commandments, for therein do I delight. And that he delighteth in the path of God's commandments, but yet he was unable to go therein. No doubt he could talk about it, pray about it, feel warmly, speak fervently, and desire it sincerely. But then came this miserable miserable powerlessness, which he asked God to overcome and to make him go in the path. Go in the path of his commandments because you do delight in them. You know, you see a beautiful girl and think I'm, uh, gee, it'd be great to have an affair. Well, I think I'll just for, you know, forget that commandment for a few days. And then maybe later I'll come back and think about it again. No, it doesn't work that way. So you should delight in his, in obedience to him, not in being taken off like this, because maybe you think you get a few hours of delight, but it's going to come crashing on your head. And it will, as Peter's song says, it will, it will. <laughs> Just a matter of time. So, you know, if you're feeling like you're not delighting in the path of his commandments, smack yourself. <laughs> and, it's not, and it's not drudgery. It's not drudgery. And that's the other thing. People think, you know, I got to get serious about uh you know, being holy and stuff. And, and then all this, you know, a lot of people get images of, you know, you can't do anything fun anymore. Or, you know, you got to give up, you know, doing do, doing stuff. It's not, it's not drudgery. Who was it who said, if you're not having fun practicing mm-hmm. Christian science, mm-hmm. you're not practicing mm-hmm. correctly. No, it's a big Big million. Thank you. It's not, uh, Miss Seti said it's not humdrum, it's repeating and defeating. Repeating, repeating, and defeating. Defeating. And, you know, when I first came here, uh, I didn't know if I was embarking on a boring life. I I didn't know at all. And uh, I was quite surprised at all that I was given back. You know, the the things that I really enjoyed doing, you know, all the things I do now putting the mag- magazine together, all that kind of thing. I love doing those things, and God gave them back to me, and I'm always so grateful for that. So. Yeah, and, and that's one of the main things, you know, to keep renewing yourself and your gratitude because that's the first sign you're going off. You're not grateful. You're fumbling around. This didn't work out. Not the Christian time. It didn't work out. Which is my chief pet peeve in the world. <laughs> and... I came upon this, and I, I just wanted to share it, because this is another thing I get a lot sometimes. This is from Footsteps, 195, quoting Mrs. Eddy. It used to be easy healing sickness, anything a man, anything, a man all cut to pieces, but now we are meeting sin. I would rather have a man with his head cut off to heal rather than sin, end quote. What did Mrs. Eddy mean by this cryptic statement which she made to students? When Mrs. Eddy first started her healing mission, it was thought to be an occasional exhibition of one who found herself with this gift. Little notice was taken of the fact that she was able to impart this healing power to others. Hence, the early students, with perhaps less spirituality than is now possessed by the average Christian science practitioner today, were able to perform with ease healings which now require much more understanding. When it began to be evident, however, that Mrs. Eddy had founded an organization where the power to heal through spiritual law could be taught and spread so that inevitably the whole civilized world would be full of spiritual healers, at once the doctors, ministers, and sinners stirred themselves to unite in stemming this tide. The doctors, because their source of income was threatened, the ministers because their congregations were threatened, and the sinners because their peace in sin was threatened. Thus, our leader recognized that today, in order to heal the sick scientifically through spiritual means, the claim of sin must be handled, where sin is defined as the malicious intent of organized mortal mind or animal magnetism to hinder and stop the march of truth on earth. 
The above quotation from our leader, therefore, points to work which was not to a work which was not needed in the early days of Christian science to the extent that it is needed today. Thus, Mrs. Eddy wanted the students at Pleasant View not to become discouraged when they heard about the miracles which she and the early students performed so easily, as if they possessed a spirituality far above any present possibility. The early workers had less organized interference. Mrs. Eddy knew that if we had been healing in those early days, we would have performed the same great works with the same ease. Now, this is written by Carpenter, who was around during her time. In the above statement, by the term sin, she unquestionably met the malicious tendency of organized opposition, endeavoring to obstruct the path of truth in its onward and irresistible march. She realized that she would rather have the worst case to heal than to meet and overcome this malicious element in mortal thought, yet she did meet it, and so can we. So I don't want to hear. <laughs> I didn't preach a topic before, but instantaneous miracle of healing that we did in three days. Please, I won't say the words that are coming to me. <laughs> Just be quiet and try doing it yourself. Try doing it yourself. Try exactly. healing yourself and see why, okay? Because you'll find out. Ding dong. Ding dong. Uh-oh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you're if your thought that if you want to be healed, but your thought is also the thought that Jesus would have to put out of the room, then <laughs> that's, not, that's not a good thing. No. So. And and you see, all the answers are in the books. They're in the in everything that we read and contemplate. It's all there. And this was something, you know, we were taught years ago why it was wasn't as easy to heal as it was in those days. But these questions, if you really study, should not be coming up. And, you know, just briefly to, to end the Psalm 119, you know, covetousness is a big thing that stumbles people. What other people are doing, what they have and you don't have. And then vanity, the things of the world. They're so appealing, you just want to go off and have a good time. And um, so very important, Psalm 119. And I thank Thomas for bringing out that importance and for making it into a Bible study. So we're going to end on some beautiful quotes. Um, yeah. And the name of the article by McKinsey, whom I love. Yes. William McKinsey. Yeah. All right. William McKinsey writes. And the name of the article. In an article named Prayer, Silent and Effective. It is interesting to learn the attitude which Mrs. Eddy commends in the individual while engaged in prayer. In an address to the Concord Church, she pictures a placid lake wherein is peacefully reflected the expanse of sky and the mild glory of the moon. She notes how this will stir the heart and says in miscellany, page 150, quote, then in speechless prayer, ask God to enable you to reflect God to become his image and likeness. Even the calm, clear, radiant reflection of Christ's glory, healing the sick, bringing the sinner to repentance, and raising the spiritually dead in trespasses and sins to life in God, end quote. Each day I pray for the speculate, for the pacification of all national difficulties for the brotherhood of man, for the end of idolatry and infidelity, and for the growth and establishment of Christian religion, Christ's Christianity. I also have faith that my prayer availeth, and that he who is overturning will overturn until he whose right it is shall reign. End quote. These words appear as if written for our health in this very hour of the world's need. Mrs. Eddy states this in No and Yes, page 39, quote, True prayer is not asking God for love. It is learning to love and to include all mankind in one affection. Prayer is the utilization of the love wherewith he loves us. Prayer begets an awakened desire to be and do good. 
It makes new and scientific discoveries of God, of his goodness and power. It shows us more clearly than we saw before what we already have and are. And most of all, it shows us what God is. Advancing in this light, we reflect it. And this light reveals the pure mind pictures in silent prayer, even as photography grasps the solar light to portray the face of pleasant thought. End quote. Mary Baker Eddy. Mary Baker Eddy. So those are just beautiful passages on, on true prayer, how she prayed, and look at all that she achieved and brought about. Thank God we got this unspeakable gift of Christian science. And thank you all for joining us today. Thank you.